Okay guys, so last time we went over the covalent bonds, we went over the ionic bonds, and we started going to hydrogen bonds, but I figured I'd save that for today. So covalent bonds, very strong, triple covalent bond, bonds are almost, you know, unbreakable. Uh -huh. Ionic bonds, also very strong. And now we're gonna talk about these interactions called hydrogen bonds, which aren't gonna be as strong as the other two. So for hydrogen bonds, guys, just as it says, it's going to involve hydrogen atoms, all right? Our main two ones that we are going to pretty much uh, use hydrogen bonds to attach are gonna be hydrogen to maybe oxygen or nitrogen, okay? So let's draw our water from last time and I'm going to make a very messy picture here, but uh, you guys will get the point of it. So I'm gonna start up here. Let me go right in the middle here. And we're just gonna say the black circles are going to be our oxygens, and then our red circles are going to be the hydrogens. So there's a water molecule, okay? And I'm gonna draw a bunch of water molecules all around. Do one color at a time here. Okay. Switch over to the black color, draw our oxygens in there. Again, guys, I told you it's going to get messy. It's not going to be perfect, but you guys will get the big picture at the end. Okay, so you know from last time that our hydrogens are all going to be slightly, not the full way, but slightly positive. So both of them will be slightly positive. And then our oxygen is gonna be slightly negative. Now, go back to like, what? fourth grade when you were messing with magnets and stuff like that, um, you had North Pole and South Pole and they attracted to one another, okay? It's kind of like the same here, opposites attract. So right here, right here, where I drew the little bit of blue in here and here, okay? That blue from last time, that was our polar covalent bond, okay? So, moral of this story, guys, is that a polar covalent bond holds one water molecule together, okay? So the polar covalent bond is the bond that holds the hydrogen to the oxygen in one water molecule. We're only talking about one water molecule here. So now, I'm gonna come in the middle of this picture and we're gonna draw some hydrogen bonds in. I'm gonna draw them in green. So we're going to have this hydrogen here, which is slightly positive, we're gonna have it do a hydrogen bond to the oxygen of this one up here, which is slightly negative. And the same thing over here, we're gonna have this guy bond to there, we're gonna have this hydrogen bond to there, this hydrogen bond to that oxygen, okay? This hydrogen bonds to that oxygen. You guys see the whole big picture here. Okay, so that's kind of how it works. These two right here are not going to bond together. Instead, they hopefully will be, you know, more down here and then it'll bond. But you guys can see that, well, let me draw one more in here. We'll have him bonding to him. Any one water molecule can make up to four bonds with other water molecules. And again, we're just talking about the uh, hydrogen bonds, okay? So it can form four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. Now these are very weak bonds. If you jump into a swimming pool or whatever, when you jump in that swimming pool, those bonds are the ones that get broken, okay? The polar covalent bonds will never get broken. They're going to stay intact. The only way the polar covalent bonds are gonna get broken is temporarily whenever the water uh, gets like boiled and then you get the gas turning into water vapor, um, but they do reform. So, you know, anyway, 
that uh, those are hydrogen bonds, guys. Again, you know, water can form up to four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. Hydrogen bonds are very weak. They can be broken. The polar covalent bonds cannot be broken. All right. Oops. Okay. Here is another hydrogen bond with water bonding to ammonia. Uh, what this tells us, guys, is if a water molecule is going to bond to something else, there's not water. What is nice about this is if the water uh, combines or mixes, we know that whatever else we put in with the water is also a polar molecule. In other words, it's held together by polar covalent bonds. If the water separates from whatever else is in there, like olive oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, um, the other substance, that oil, we know is nonpolar because it doesn't combine. Okay, so last uh, force guys, Van der Waals interactions. We don't have to really know much about these guys. They're pretty much the same as hydrogen bonds with respect to strength. Only difference is they probably don't involve hydrogen, okay? So that's your only difference. They're very weak, kind of like a um, gecko, okay, the little lizard looking guys, these guys. Their toes being able to cling to different surfaces, that's a van der Waals force. Again, I'm not going to uh, dwell on those because they're not extremely important. Next thing in your book, guys, goes over shape with things. Um, this is another thing we're not going to touch on that much. This was more chemistry. Uh, I've never seen any questions on the AP test with respect to uh, bond symmetry and bonding angles. So we're going to skip over this, but just so you guys know, uh, all these molecules are not going to always be in a perfect line, okay? They might have some kind of angle to them. That's it. Okay, for this slide, guys, I have two different um, hormones. So there is epinephrine, or I'm sorry, <laughs> endorphin uh, on the one side, and then morphine on the other side. Now, morphine is something that uh, you guys can get if you get surgery done, if you're in a lot of pain, they might give you morphine. But anyway, so on this cell down here, we have our cell membrane and we have two receptors that are built into the cell membrane. There's some kind of protein. But if you notice, that same receptor bonds both endorphin, which your body produces, and morphine. So once morphine attaches to some of these, you get these endorphins pumping. And the, the endorphins, guys, naturally give you like this sense of euphoria and it really reduces stress. Um, since the, the morphine attaches to that, this is why people get addicted to morphine because it attaches to the same receptors. So whenever they get morphine, they kind of get that same feeling of euphoria and less stress. Uh, so it, it's kind of not good that uh, morphine has more than one thing. Yeah, it, it helps with pain, but at the same time, it gives you this, this happy feeling. Um, so anyway, that's the end of chapter uh, section three, guys. Let's go to section four. We're just going to do a little bit of it today. I'm going to try to get to the math. There is a little bit of math in this chapter, and then we'll call it. So in a chemical reaction, we are going to have reactants, which things that are put into the chemical reaction, and then we're going to have things that we get out of it, which are called the products. So in this one, we have H2, naturally occurring hydrogen, and oxygen, which is two oxygens bonded together. When they react, we get water out of it. So the reactants are going to be what we put in, that's hydrogen and oxygen, and the products are water. Okay, easy enough. Here is our photosynthesis equation. What we have here, guys, is we have to keep this balanced. So we have to get out the same amount of elements as we put in. So these little coefficients in front, the six, the six, and then the six here in front of oxygen, they tell us how many molecules of each we're going to have to put in to the photosynthesis reaction. So we have six carbon dioxide, CO2, plus six H2O. Those are your reactants for photosynthesis. And then your product, C6H12O6, that's going to be your glucose. And then we get six oxygens out of it. But so if you notice, we only get one glucose, but we got to put in six carbon dioxides, six waters, and we get out six oxygens, but only one sugar. 
Underwater, guys, we can see this happen. We can see this release of oxygen. Uh, here's some algae, or algae, as some people call it. If you guys have ever seen uh, Moana, uh, I can't remember the one guy's name. It starts with a T, the big crab. He calls it algae, bioluminescent algae. But anyway, so you guys can see it on the algae. There is um, like bubbles that form, okay? So this like, it's called a lodia, but um, the bubbles form and then the bubbles will get released. So this shows us that the plants even can photosynthesize underwater, which is kind of cool. So all chemical reactions are reversible, guys, meaning here's our reactants, here's our products. We could reverse that arrow, okay? We could put the reactants on this side and the products on this side. Only problem is, again, they are reversible. Only problem is one way we will probably need energy, the other way we will give off energy. So even though they are reversible, there is some kind of um, energy pay that we we need for the one direction. Okay, that was a very short section. So section five, I know this is a very long chapter, guys. It starts off talking about water molecules. Okay, we're gonna go a little bit into that. Most of it we already know from what we've already gone over, but you guys know the oxygen is slightly negative. There's your delta, your partial charge, negative. And then the hydrogen is slightly positive. Two different water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. So one water molecule, guys, again, one water molecule is held together by polar covalent. Adjacent water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. And there's a good picture of what we just drew earlier. You guys can see that inner water molecule. It's bonding four different water molecules. And each one of those can also bond four more. But you can see the hydrogen bo uh, bonds there are little dotted lines. So we're going to go over the behavior of water. And we'll go over each one of these individually. So let's get going with it. Cohesion. Cohesion is literally water sticking to other water molecules. Okay. Adhesion is water sticking to other things. So in like a glass of water, guys, if we have the water clinging together, if I have a glass of water, the water clinging to other water molecules, in other words, why it's like nice and flat at the bottom of your, your glass, you don't see the water like, oh, look, some water's down here, and then I got a big old air bubble right in the middle, and then I got more water up here. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. All the water is together. That shows cohesion. Also, you take your water glass, you spill all of it out. Well, yeah, the water came out, but there's still some water left at the bottom. If you were to like spill water out and then let it, the water cup just sit there for a minute and then spill it out again, you'll get more water out of the glass. Why that is, is because all the water, once you spill it out, the rest of it is clung, cling, clung, yeah. Uh -huh. It clings to the side of the glass and over time, that adhesion, the water clinging to the side of the glass, it breaks because water molecules are also trying to bond to other water molecules cohesion, and then they all end up settling at the bottom of the glass once again. So climbing up a tree, guys, you know that the water enters the tree through the roots, okay? If I have a ball in my hand and I drop the ball, the <laughs> drop the ball, get it? <laughs> uh, if I drop the ball, the ball goes down. But for trees, you water it from the bottom and it goes all the way to the top, all the way to the tippy top, all the way to the leaves. Because the leaves go through photosynthesis, that's what needs the water. Well, how the heck does this happen, right? So there's these little tubes in this uh, black and white picture here. They're called xylem, X-Y-L-E-M. So those little xylem tube guys, um, those little xylem tubes, what they do is they're going to carry water upward. So the water is going to cling to other water molecules in cohesion, and then the water is also going to cling to the side of the xylem tubes and go all the way up. So there's a better picture of the xylem tubes, guys, close up. So you can see what's going on there. Surface tension. So on top of water, guys, I don't know if you ever tried to float a paper clip or anything like that. But you can float a paper clip on top of water and it might just stay there. It might sink to the bottom, but you could definitely get, you know, if you try a few times, you could definitely get it to float on top. 
That is called surface tension. And the property of water that demonstrates surface tension is going to be cohesion, so water sticking to water. <clears throat> In other words, guys, the water is so bonded together on top through those hydrogen bonds that it's able to actually have some tension on top. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's a little spider guys walking on top of the water. You can see the little impressions that its feet make right there. Got the feet are able to kind of puncture the water a little bit without breaking all the way through. And here's a little video for you guys. In the jungles of Costa Rica, speed is everything for the basilisk lizard. When you prey on winged insects, you need to be quick because your prey moves fast, really fast. So when the basilisk is in a hurry, it displays one of the most spectacular capabilities in nature. A true superpower. This flat-footed reptile is so fast and so light that it can run across the surface of the water at speeds as much as five feet per second. But speed alone doesn't make this superpower possible. Long toes on their rear feet, along with fringes of skin that unfurl to meet the water, create little air pockets under the lizard's feet and the air pockets give the lizard lift. A true superpower in nature. All right, I like that video. Cute little lizard. Here's another one, guys, of it in real time so you can see without it being slowed down how fast they are. You okay? Yeah, they're playing. Playing, uh. oh. <laughs> See? <laughs> Did you get it? I think so. Yeah, she was playing. All right. Kind of cool. I like the Jesus Christ lizard. Um, however, guys, the basilisk lizard, okay, if you looked closely, it was actually breaking the plane of water. So it's the air, because it, its foot almost goes like this um, instead of being flat footed like we would be. Its foot is able to go like this. And we got a nice air pocket underneath. And that's how it's able to go in the water. It actually is kind of <clears throat> breaking that surface tension a little bit. So, yeah, it can walk on water, but it's not perfectly walking on water. So, next one, guys. Next property of water is water can absorb a lot of heat before it changes its temperature. In other words, water does not want to change its temperature. There's different types of energy. There's kinetic energy, thermal energy. We'll talk about those um, a little bit more later, especially kinetic energy. But thermal energy is a measure of the total amount of kinetic energy due to molecular motion. In other words, guys, when we talk about water, we're going to pump energy into the water, something. The sun probably is going to do most of it. When the sun puts its rays down onto the water, the water actually does its best to try to resist taking on that energy from the sun. Okay, so we will probably do this example, guys, and then we will call it a day. Um, here is some equations for you to look at. Now, a calorie, don't think of it a cal as like a calorie of food. You know how you guys should be eating like a 2,000 calorie diet, diet? That's a little bit different than this calorie. Uh, those calories are actually like kilocalories. So anyway, a calorie is amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, so 
The joule down here, that's a measure of energy. Uh, it's just a unit we use, just like, you know, for us, we do weight in pounds, um, fluid in ounces, those types of things. But anyway, one joule is 0.239 calories, or we could say one calorie is 4.184 joules, okay? So there are two constants there. So let me write those down for us before we get into this problem. All right, so we have one joule, one joule equals 0 0.239 calories. And the other one, one calorie equals 4.184 joules. Okay. <clears throat> So here's my question for you guys. If we have 10 grams of water, ten grams of water, how much heat, or how much energy, I should say, how much energy would it take to raise the water? by five degrees Celsius. Okay. So we're gonna go into all of this, but you gotta know that a calorie, okay, one calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, let me say it one more time. A calorie is the amount of, amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So this question here, we have two parts to it. We got grams and we got temperature, okay? The thing I just said, guys, one gram of water by one degree Celsius is a calorie. That's one and one. Neither of these numbers is one, which kind of, you know, makes things difficult. Here's how we do this problem. We're gonna do it in two steps. And I know right now you're like, oh my goodness, this seems complicated, it's not. So we're gonna do one step and then we're gonna do our second step. It doesn't matter which step you do first, okay? We can either work with the grams first and then do the temperature, or you could flip-flop them, do the temperature first and then work with the grams. It really doesn't matter. So I'm gonna start with 10 grams of water, okay? And I'm gonna put that over one so you guys can see the units. It's like a T-chart in Miss Herman's class, kind of, okay? So what we're gonna do is since we have 10 grams of water, we know that each gram of water to raise it one degree Celsius takes one calorie or, we're talking about energy, 4.18, four joules per gram, okay? So we'd multiply them together and we would get 41.84 joules, okay? So that's the weight part. We're done with the weight part, that's it, all right? Um, now we're gonna do the temperature part. So how much are we raising it? Five degrees Celsius. Put that over one, okay? Once again, we know that it takes 4.184 joules to raise, because that's one calorie, to raise the temperature of water by one degree Celsius. So we're just going to manipulate this equation a little bit, and we get 20.92 joules. Okay, so we have a weight thing here and then a temperature equation. We're going to add them together, and then we get 62. 0.76 joules, okay? Now, if you wanted to do it a little differently, guys, you could just add the five in here too, okay? Uh, and it would like do another one where you, you're timesing it by five as well. You could do it like that too and you'll get the same answer, okay? 
Um, I think that's it for that math problem, guys. So again, if it was just a one-step problem, how you know how much energy would it, does it take to raise one gram of water by five degrees Celsius? We got a one here for you know the grams, so we would only have to do the second part. But since this is dealing with two numbers that are not one, that's when you got to do a two-step, uh, two parts, and then just add the answers together. So, all right, guys, um, I think that's enough for today. We'll call it a day, and we will resume tomorrow. We're going to do a little bit more uh, math tomorrow and hopefully get into pH. Have a good day.